All right, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us on the 25th Industry Insights. We have a great panel for you today. We're gonna to dive right in. We're gonna talk about the next phase of the GRIP funding, uh, about the, the goals of transforming the grid, enabling data-rich and flexible grid performance, spurring innovation, um, two fantastic panelists with us today. Uh, we have Calvin Tong. Calvin's the senior manager at West Monroe in their energy and utility practice. And perhaps more importantly for this conversation, he leads the company's uh, federal funding center of excellence. So Calvin, thank you for joining us, appreciate it. And we have Karen Whalen. Karen uh, is the CEO of the Gridwise Alliance. And she's got a history on Capitol Hill in the House and in the Senate and with the administration and also with the Department of Energy. So I think we have two fantastic subject matter experts joining us. And uh, we're going to we're going to go through a round of questions and then uh, and then we're going to see if we can we can make some headway and and uh, unlock some of the some of the new issues surrounding the GRIP program. So um, first, I'm going to start, Calvin, with you. Can you tell me a little bit uh, macro level about West Monroe and then micro level, more importantly, I think, about the, the Federal Funding Center of Excellence and the, and the work that you and the team are doing? Sure. Yeah. So West Monroe uh, is a digital services and consulting firm. We're, we're, we're based out of Chicago, but we have offices from coast to coast. Um, I, I think, as Chris mentioned, I, I specifically work under our energy and utilities practices, but we, we have uh, a number of other verticals as well, spanning across, you know, uh, healthcare, M and A, com uh, consumer industrial products, um, but uh, 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 under the energy and utilities practice, we do a variety of things from uh, 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 regulatory strategy, uh, kind of telecom uh, road mapping, uh, long term program management. But again, specifically, while I'm why why uh, I'm on this panel is uh, we also help uh, clients in securing uh, funding. Uh, specifically under the IIJA and the IRA uh, to support their grid modernization efforts. So uh, at a micro level, uh, uh, my role is to uh, work with utilities across the entire life cycle of grants uh, and, and pursuing grants from kind of the initial ideation and scoping of competitive and differentiated uh, uh, scopes, but then also going through development of the concept papers to full applications and, of course, the post-award compliance and, and reporting. Um, but yeah, so that that that's that's me in a nutshell. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And Karen, tell us a little bit about Gridwise and the work that you did, because I know I experienced it firsthand in the run up to this legislation, and sort of your thoughts and and how you're helping to lead a lot of the a lot of the thinking and the interactions with DOE. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, so Gridwise Alliance is a member organization of utilities. Of um, we have three of the five regional transmission organizations. We have um, a number of the big technology solution providers um, for and grid manufacturers and consultants who work in the grid space. We uh, work on um, articulating the benefits of grid modernization. And in, I started in 2020, and that, as you all remember, was right around when the pandemic, uh, you know, caused the economy to shut down. And I was, um, it really felt to me like. Um, a little bit like 2008, 2009, when Congress was putting together a big recovery package. Yep. And so we put together a set of recommendations um, for any kind of recovery package that that Congress might consider as they were trying to jumpstart the economy. And um, and it was a set of recommendations on different programs that um, that Congress could fund at the Department of Energy, at the Department of Commerce, at the Department of Transportation um, to make investments in grid infrastructure to help uh, move the economy forward as well as to modernize the grid to meet the demands of the 21st century. And so we were successful in getting, I mean, depending on how you add up the, the dollars, um, anywhere from 30 to, if you count the $42.5 billion that utilities are eligible for at Commerce Department for uh, broadband, you know, that adds that we get up to about $70 billion yeah. of money that utilities are eligible for under the just the infrastructure bill. Um, so, and uh, I can't take responsibility for all of it, but I, I think we did help shape a significant part of it, including, you know, smart grid investment grants for flexibility came directly from our set of recommendations. So we're, we're, um, our impl effective implementation of that money is our number one priority right now. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. And we're going to, we're going to dig into that a little bit, right? That two-step process that you need. First, you need 
language in the legislation, then you need to ensure that the that the agencies interpret it the way the way you intended, right? So, um, so we're going to go. We're going to just a, one quick speed round, um, five words or less, and I'll we'll start the other way. Karen, I'll start with you. Five words or less. How is this round of the GRIP program going to be different? And I will say we're not allowed to curse on industry insights, so you can't you can't explain it in five words or less the way you did to me this morning. <laughs> Um, it, I threw you for a loop by saying you can't curse. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, it uh, more targeted and less um, uh, more targeted and a more specific concept paper. That's not five words. Okay, that's close enough. That people don't usually adhere to the to the word limit. But Calvin. Um, yeah, I probably will not adhere to the word limit. I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. But, but uh, I, I think one is it, it's going to likely be a lot more competitive this round. There is a entire round of first uh, a, a lot of folks uh, that had sat on the sidelines the first round. So, uh, and I think there's a lot more information now to make uh, effectively push a lot of utilities over the edge to try to apply this round. The other is in, innovation. Uh, which we'll talk about right. probably throughout this entire uh, yeah. webinar. And then the last, what we've heard is the benefits. So, so really focusing on what, what's the benefits and the quantifications of such. I think that's going to be a greater emphasis this round. Okay, good, 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 good. So first round, 58 projects, 44 states, 3.5 billion. Um, what did we learn? You know, what did what what valuable insights did we did we gather? Uh, you know, from that first iteration of the funding. Um, and how do you then take that, those learnings, and apply them to focus on or to align with DOE's focuses? So, Calvin, I'll come back to you, and then, and then Karen, I'll go down to you. But, you know, valuable insights, what did we learn? How do, how do we ensure that folks align with DOE's priorities? Yeah, no. Um, so I think just fundamentally in the actual application of these, I think, uh, the, these are hard. The, the applications are meant to be difficult and thoughtful and uh, intended to force utilities to really um, um, work across multiple stakeholders and, and outside silos. So I think that's just one just in the actual application process is to be comfortable uh, doing so. You know, this is now there's community benefits part portions of this. There's the technical component. Being able to marry the two is going to require a lot of collaboration. And I think it's important to tell that storyline. So that's that's kind of the one major as you develop the applications that that we learned in that first round. But I think the the second is just looking at um, so so our team did a full disposition, uh, uh, basically a disposition of all, basically a post post mortem of all the applications that we supported, as well as the 50 plus. Uh, we went through all the one pagers, and, and basically, you know, I don't think there's fundamentally going to be a, um, a, a I don't think the first round is fundamentally different than this round. I think the deal we just been a lot more explicit in specifying what they want to see this round because I think um, uh, what what really drove the most successful applications are those that looked, you know, five, ten years in, in in the future and kind of what are the problems that you're going to solve uh, uh, five, ten years down the line versus I think some of the some of the unsuccessful applications were those looking in the near term of you know, hey, what projects can I pull forward in the you know two years and, and pull that up? I think it's just being able to take that step back and say, you know, how am, how is these this solution fundamentally going to be differentiated against all these other applications? Um, so I think that's one piece is just recognizing um, how to cobble together solutions and not just focusing on just pure technology. Um, um, and then I think the second uh, that they're, they're they're obviously making a push towards is uh, looking for more consortiums, or how do you de-risk these these very innovative solutions by bringing in other partners, whether they be vendors or partnered with with other utilities. So, uh, just being creative in these stakeholders that you bring, and not just being a kind of myopic. What what can our utility do? Yeah, yeah, and we we we've seen 
Um, we've seen that in, in what's been said publicly from the department. I think many of us have, have heard that in what we've heard privately from the department in terms of the, you know, a focus on, on innovation and, and uh, sort of transformative type solutions. Karen, sort of same question to you, valuable insights from the first go round. Um, one thing I will note is just as everyone's incorporating valuable insights from the first iteration, they also change their priorities to some extent, right? So you're applying what you might've learned to a new or evolving or different focus set of priorities. So Karen, thoughts? Yeah, well, I think that's right. I mean, they changed a few things. One is one is kind of what they're focusing on in terms of who's eligible. And they are, they are encouraging this consortium approach that Calvin mentioned, multi-utility um, vendor led, um, uh, applicants, which means that the vendor can work with multiple utilities. So they are trying to scale. Um, and then and then the topic areas have, have changed somewhat. And there is a much larger emphasis on transmission. And, and I do think that that presents issues because the transmission and distribution systems look different. They have different owners. They have di different different models. So how they do the vendor and multi-utility approach and also focus on transmission is going to be interesting. Um, I also think that um, that there is a lot of money. Well, we we did an analysis of all the money that's available in the infrastructure bill for uh, transmission and how much is available specifically for distribution. And particularly with the Smart Grid Investment Grant for flexibility uh, and I think some of the resilience money, that's money that the distribution system can access, right. but they can't. But but owners and operators of distribution systems can't access the transmission money. So if there's a focus of all this grip funding on transmission, it has a potential to shortchange the very real needs at the distribution level for grid modernization. So that's something that we're going to be yeah. watching. Yeah. Well, and I I like the fact that you you frame that in something that you're going to be watching because it's going to it's a segue to my next question. But before we do, I I do want to go back to both of you on that question. Um, we've seen, again, words like transform, spur innovation, enable data rich uh, priorities. I'm just going to look at my list. Uh, Calvin, you referenced this, multiple utility service areas, but they've also talked about automation, digitization, interconnection, advanced technologies. There, there's a lot of focus on, um, on moving the grid forward technologically. Do you, do you see that reflected in in what they're saying their priorities are and and is that in conflict at all karen i'll throw this part of it to you with their focus on transmission right so a lot of the a lot of the uh enhancements uh, technologically seem to be more distribution related not all of them obviously but there is a a, a focus on on transmission within the department is the can we make sure that works Hmm. <clears throat> well, I, you know, there, there are a lot of needs on the transmission system as well. We, we know we need new transmission and, and this grip money can't be used for new transmission, but it can be used for grid enhancing technologies and other resilience measures at the transmission level. Um, and it can also be used for the distribution level. I, I, I think there's no question that we need both. Um, and, but I think the, um, the risks that the policymakers have to take, particularly at the state level and the public utility commissions and the, this interplay between the investments that we know have to be made and the, the direct implications for rates, for customer rates, you really feel that very strongly at the distribution level. And it makes policymakers like state commissions much more hesitant to approve these big, huge grid modernization projects where that we know need to happen it, it just look it just looks and feels different at the transmission level in terms of financing and in terms of the impact on customer rates. So I think we always thought of the grit money as helping to de-risk those those public policy decisions that are going to impact the rate payer directly. So that's yeah. that's the thing that we're going to be watching is is um, are we going to be able to really see that transformational change at the distribution level and at the transmission level? Yeah, Calvin, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there, there's also um, 
I think when you talk about kind of, I think there's there's two questions that I think one was the, the transmission piece, but I think the first you mentioned around the uh, alignment with pushing forth technology and innovation. Yeah. I think I think that to that first first question, I think I, I just recognition that topic area two is a revival of the smart grid investment grants from 2009. Uh, and you, you think about where we are more than a decade plus later, uh, the intent of that was to similarly catalyze technologies. And back then it was advanced metering. It was in the MDM. It was some of that. I think the vision of that was to obviously, uh, 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 you know, help bring utilities forward, automate, bring more data. And I think it did that. I mean, I think, you know, I think the the tenure vision back back there probably fell short of, you know, AMI can't solve everything. But I think fundamentally that's where the dollars catalyze. So similarly, you know, looking at kind of the way they framed a lot of this and, and the, the awards in the first round and also where they're pushing forth in the, the second round is what is the quote unquote new AMI? So what I mean by that is like 10, 10 years from now, what, what are the technologies that they want to see um, be kind of the norm going forward? You know, AMI nowadays, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's table stakes. So, so what's going to happen in 10 years? And, and I think part of that is, well, you know, if you look at some of the awards in the first round, some of those were, you know, getting further into the grid the grid edge you know how do we get more visibility at the edge how do we introduce ai a lot of these new technologies on the transmission side you know they they explicitly called out like dynamic line rating uh you know how, how do you how do you do things beyond just building capacity physical capacity on the transmission level yeah. can you also look at these other grid enhancing technologies and advance those and and help those so 10 years down the line you now have these options beyond just having to build out additional capacity and reducing Kind of the impacts to to customers, um, you know, how do you how do you leverage these technologies to 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 supplement uh, um, physical build out? And I think that's where they're trending towards, and they've specifically called out technologies to to enable some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, one of the things they've talked about and that we've talked about is um, the emphasis on focusing on comprehensive solutions that scale, right? I think all of us have used the word scale. Um, how do, you know, how do, how do we effectively link, uh, well, Antarctic is obviously a communications company, but I think all of us have talked about the underpinning of broadband and the necessity as you push these technologies to the edge. How do you link that, you know, grid communications and broadband and the, ne and the necessity to enhance resilience to these programs? What, what do you think? And Calvin, I'll start with you, and then and then Karen, I'll come back to you. Yeah, no, um, I think you you said it right. C communications underpins grid pot. Like that's that's just fundamental. Um, utilities have deployed communications for for uh, since since the beginning of time. You know, they they they, they it, it is it is how utilities function. I think um, um, when we talk about kind of the improvements of resiliency, reliability, you know, a lot of that is contingent upon Automation and faster automation, greater visibility, all of that is just is just incumbent on faster communications and 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 um, where you know you can see kind of advancement of that and where I think it's being encouraged. Again, I think I go back to um, you know that previous answer around you know getting more visibility at the edge or in those pockets of areas where maybe there is less. Uh, communications or not as uh, not broadband level communications um, that's where technologies such as you know wireless or fiber like the expansion of such uh, is going to be necessary and it, but but I think fundamentally it's it's not going to be if you're looking at building an application solely around the the communications piece it's going to be very hard to differentiate that but if you weave in communications with a variety of kind of uh, uh, technologies and, and really tie it to a problem statement and a use case um, and something that's obviously more innovative that, then it becomes more uh, uh, impactful but I think if you look at the first rounds there was communications woven through many of the applications it just was not the highlight but it was a recognition that it is a necessity and should be uh, and will likely be a part of a lot of folks applications in this round as well yeah Karen yeah and that's that's something that um we saw too when we looked at all the applications is that they um, they really funded a suite of technologies and not an emphasis on on one particular technology. We we did spend a fair amount of time uh, in the lead up to this this the first round of grip funding, making sure that that um, DOE understood that they needed to look at a suite of technologies because some of the um, advocacy around that first round of grip funding was that um, that 
it shouldn't include funding for any kind of AMI meters. And we know that one of the basic building blocks of a modern grid is going to be, you know, advanced meter infrastructure that can that can transmit data back and forth across the grid, which requires communication networks. And so we, you know, we um, we did see this emphasis in this in the first round on the on looking for suites of technologies. In fact, some of our members who um, put in applications, um, some got them and some didn't, and they and they did note that uh, it it was the suite of technologies that got DOE. And and I and I would say that um, the community we haven't talked about community benefits yet. But We're going to come to that. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Okay amount of time emphasizing the need for very uh, strong community benefits plans. So, yeah, and and, and uh, we're, we're going to peel that back a little bit because I do think, I think you're right. I think that is um, uh, obviously a key element of any application during this, this iteration of the funding. Um, but Karen, I, so in the lead up, to the legislation. I know you and I worked in, and uh, Gridwise was great at incorporating communications into uh, the, the language. And I think I think you and I, um, whether it's through um, middle mile funding or or through some of the different iterations of the, the movement and capture of data and, and the different pieces that you see in there, um, there was a lot of work that was done in advance. Um, you know, Calvin, you said, communications can be obviously a key component, but Karen, what what kind of work do we have to continue to do to ensure that the agency interprets the legislative language the way the way I think many of us wanted them to, right? I think I, to me, it's, there's, it's always bifurcated. There's always a two-step approach to this, but I, I wanna sort of have you unpack that a little bit and then maybe we'll throw it over to Calvin. Well, I think that um, in Department of Energy, in the lead up to administering this, you know, historic amount of money, did did um, two things. One is they did a reorganization where they created a new set of um, offices, and the other thing they did was they had to ramp up. And and um, even if they hadn't done the reorg, they would have to hire hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people in order to administer sixty something billion dollars of money. So we started talking to um, DOE about the administration of of this money right away but what we've learned is we have to keep talking to them yeah. over and over and over again because we're we're not always talking to the same people because they they're bringing new people in and so i i do think um reminding people about what's actually in the statute because the statute is very clear uh, you know it it has for example in the 4101d funding uh it has a list of a through g or beyond of yeah. specific types of technologies and projects that can, that can be funded and then underneath each of those categories, we know you can expand those even further. And so making sure that, and, and we're actually working on a paper that that uh, tries to lay out some of the technologies that can be funded under the eligible projects so that we can have regular conversations, not just with DOE, but don't forget that, that in one pot of money, half the money goes to the states for the states to give out for the exact same purpose as DOE. Yeah. So there's there's five billion dollars that's going to go to this list of projects. We want to make sure they understand all the technologies that can be funded and how those technologies work together. So our kind of one pager summaries on these technologies talk about not only about what the technology does, but what the technology dependencies are so that people understand that if you deploy AMI, but you're not deploying a modern communication network, you're not going to get the benefits, the full benefits of an advanced meter. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. I had a conversation recently with a key policymaker, uh, specifically along those lines, Karen. So it was uh, it was about falling conductor, right? So uh, so Schweitzer Engineering Labs has a uh, has a, a solution that de de energizes a broken line before it hits the ground, right? So you can imagine how transformational that is, how much of a game changer. It's a proactive way to to prevent and, and mitigate wildfires. One of the things they've said on multiple panels is that capability has been around for a while, but until you integrate it into a high speed, low latency, prioritized private network, it doesn't work, right? You could pull fiber to every one of those those nodes, and yes, it would probably work, but in, in the high risk areas, you probably don't have fiber, and you certainly don't have fiber to every single uh, endpoint at the, at the edge. And so I 
highlighted that the that the, the different funding mechanisms, multiple ones, can support uh, the the communications backbone for that. Um, I was asked to point out to where in the sections. So, and I did. We've have them highlighted, but uh, but it was an interesting process because to me it it is an element of you have to get it into the legislation. And then you have to re-advocate for why it is, where it is, things like that. Calvin, have you seen or experienced any of that as you've as you've helped different utilities uh, sort of prepare for the first round and as they're getting ready to to uh, submit concept papers for the second round? In terms of the like the education of the communications aspects, yeah, um, yeah, no, I, I think this is this also just goes beyond just just funding or grant grant funding. I think there is there is there is definitely I think an education aspects just even when you think about um, you know going through regulatory filings for communication upgrades and uh, recognizing the nuances and the differences between kind of legacy communication networks and the limitations they provide if you want to enable the things that you know regulators and in, in this case you know what what the uh, 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 grant administrators of DOE is looking to to enable, right? I think it, it is things like, you know, as Karen described, like what are the dependencies in order to do so? And I think it sometimes is, is it, it, it takes time to to educate those things. Um, but but uh, I, I think there is just there's you know speaking in analogies and and trying to just be 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 top of mind there. I think uh, is is going to be beneficial. I don't, I don't think it's going to be like one single solution. Yeah. Um, but I think it is it is because of the fact that, you know, oftentimes you get the question of, oh, we have we have certain networks today. Uh, why can't we just use those networks going forward? And I think there's from there you can have the kind of conversations on, OK, um, you know, five, 10 years from now, what, what are we trying to do? Uh, and then kind of work backwards on how the communications network enables you to do to do those things. Yeah. Yep. I apologize. Okay. I know that my um my uh, internet is coming in and out, so sorry about that. I'm at the we, end. We yeah, we haven't lost you uh, uh, at all from a voice perspective, Karen. We've okay. lost we've lost the video every once in a while, but that's okay. Um, never lose my voice. I, can I can I jump in on yeah, that? Yeah. Because because I think there's a huge and I give talks about the the um the equity issues around uh, customers being connected to a modern grid with a modern communication network because. You think about how um, customers in uh, consumers in a um, in a in a large IOU footprint um, where they've been able to make the investments in SCADA and AMI and um, and the way that the customer can interact with the grid is just different. They can under they can they can be control their electricity remotely. They can see their usage. They can um, you know they if they've if they've got um, a electric vehicle, they can get time of use signals. There are there are real and and also, if there's a power outage in an area where there are advanced um, equipment, digital equipment installed with a communication network, the restoration is um, is shorter. The disturbance is usually uh, shorter, and so there are real uh, benefits and costs to not being. Um, uh, connected to a modern grid. So I, I think that's going to be something that we um, because when when these community benefit plans, when DOE is looking at them, they're looking at you know EJ40 uh, components. Like 40% yep. of the benefits have to go to disadvantaged communities, and yet you could look at the footprint of a territ of a utility that doesn't have SCADA systems, that doesn't have advanced meters, and the entire territory might be at a disadvantage versus you know looking for 40% of the footprint. Right. So. Yeah, we're 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 seeing um, utilities as uh, in the in the private LTE in the wireless broadband space. We're seeing utilities looking at ways to take that infrastructure that they're deploying and make it available to their communities. Right. So, you know, in the in the co-op space, some of them may actually want to provide the wireless or fiber-backed broadband, but in the IOU community, we're seeing more of the model be. We're going we're gonna to deploy this infrastructure. We're going to pull this fiber. We're attaching electricity. We're putting in cabinets at the bottom. We're securing rights of way. Let's make that available to the community so that they can they can uh, 
enjoy the benefits of that infrastructure that we've already, you know, we've already uh, deployed. We've already spent money to deploy. Um, to me, that that gets us. And Karen, you you address this, the community benefits uh, requirement, right? The Justice 40, uh, you know, the focus on on uh, really ensuring that this money uh, does well and does good, sort of the the, the combination. Um, Calvin, you, I thought I thought West Monroe did a great very digestible paper on community benefits. I saw you were one of the co-authors of it. Um, talk talk to me, first of all, about that, and then specifically sort of how we would tie the communications element of an application of a concept paper and, and ultimately uh, an application, a full application, how we would tie that to community benefits. Yeah, so... Community benefits. I mean, I think also isn't isn't just you know again taking a step back from you know the federal funding, community benefits plans, and just also just recognizing the emphasis on equity and energy equity is now becoming more you know uh, uh, evident across you know just just regulatory bodies. So you're starting to see the terminology being adopted uh, as as kind of almost like just mandating you know utilities start thinking about the investments they make. Uh, just long-term investments they're making from an equitable standpoint. So I just obviously want to preface that. But but we we had worked with we have we have some folks uh, uh, internal to West Monroe that kind of researched all the uh, underlying requirements around community benefits and uh, as part of our kind of energy equity team. Um, and I, I think what what I often try to stress to utilities because this is a new uh, uh, part of these these applications. And it's not just going to be limited to just, for instance, the GRIP funding. You're going to see it if you want to apply for the, the loan program office, any, any type of the provisions and loans under the IRA. Uh, you're going to be asked to also submit a community benefits plan. Many other programs under IIJA also require the community benefits plan. And I think what it comes down to and what we try to stress is just being very intentional and in bringing it to truly to the community level. So we talk about the stakeholders that you engage, you know, making sure they are localized as you're seeking input. So beyond just the quantification of the benefits, like you need to demonstrate that there is intent behind it, that we are going to commit as a utility. And it, it, it manifests itself through in this second round in a couple of ways. If you look at the, um, the concept paper form and you look at the character limits on the new concept paper form, you notice that there's double the character limits on all the community benefits pieces. Versus yep. the technical piece. So everyone's got a technical solution to this. How do you differentiate it? You've got to show in how you you're gonna you're you're gonna intentionally drive uh, the innovation and 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 uh, uh, benefits to those communities. Um, so that that that's one. And then um, uh, you know I think the other is just uh, uh, in, ensuring that you're working towards you know meaningful arrangements. Um, of, of you know community benefit agreements, not just you know the soft hey we're gonna we're gonna engage with you and talk with you on a regular no no what what are you gonna do to meaningfully invest and that manifests itself through the fact in this funding round there is a separate community benefits budget justification form last year there was just the technical budget justification form so now there is kind of this ask from the DOE this round to include your specific you know proposals investment proposals around the community benefits plan. So that's kind of the, the thought process around um, the community benefits plan overall. And when you think of, I think the second part of your question, Chris, was around, you know, communications yeah. and that, that plays a role. I, I think you, you alluded to a couple, right? I think some is, well, how, do, how can the communications network double in some of these other ancillary non-grid, you know, can it, can it potentially help with, you know, broadband enablement and in in, in kind of those unserved, underserved areas. That's that's kind of one element. But the other is just, just you know, when you think about uh, the the communications network or lack thereof in some of these areas and disadvantaged communities, how can it accelerate the benefits to those communities? So, uh, you know, historical solutions, are they wholly dependent on fiber, for instance? Well, well can, you, can you replace that with, you know, some wireless broadbands, those, those specific use cases, and, and enable those benefits much, much sooner at, at less cost. That's a way to potentially demonstrate that through communications um, um, that, you know, uh, in terms of accelerating the community benefits to those areas. 
Yeah, no, that's good. That's great. And one of the things we we pushed for and, you know, Karen was there for for a bunch of this was, you know, if you support wireless, you get the wireless infrastructure that you can put other antennas on. You also get the fiber that's that's that, you know, our utility drags to that to that antenna and to that uh, to that tower. So, Karen, I, w- I want to go to you and 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 have you unpack a little bit because you're the one uh, who gave us that segue about community benefits, the importance of it. But I also, I mean, there are other boxes to check, right? Union jobs, jobs, things like things like that. So, um, I'd love I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of that. So, we did have a number of DOE people speaking at our Grid Connects meeting last week, and um, and on the jobs issue, they if they said it once, they said it multiple times. It's not just about creating jobs, it's about creating good jobs. Yeah. And I know that um, I think a lot of that's coming from, first of all, they want them to be uh, labor jobs. They want to, you know, a clear articulation of how you're going to comply with Davis Bacon. But um, but it, I think it stems from, from the argument in the solar industry that um, solar is going to create lots of jobs. And it turns out that, that an, a, a lot of the jobs that were created didn't look on paper, they looked like jobs, but in the in the field, they weren't that great of jobs. They were kind of low-paying jobs where you were snapping solar panels onto frames. And and so the administration is is really thinking about how you create, you know, jobs that last a long time, jobs that allow people that you know that they're considered a living wage, and that actually you know um, contribute to the community. And and um, and so some of the um, some of the projects that got funding had some really interesting community benefits where they were um, investing in high schools and 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 training programs with high schools and so they were really looking for this kind of you know investing in the community as well as you know giving somebody a job they want those jobs to last a long time and to be and to build and to you know enrich the community in more ways than just, you know the hourly wage yeah and, i, I couple of great words, Calvin, that you used intentional, uh, meaningful th- things like that. Right. I think, I think Karen, that's what you're, you're reflecting. And Calvin, did you have something else you want no, to say? You, you uh, said exactly what I was going to point out is it, it yeah. to tie this together. Exactly. Intention, you know, really, really being specific on the specific jobs you're going to enable and not just, you know, throwing in kind of a ratio and saying, oh, based on this investment, we're going to enable X amount of jobs. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's really being intentional. Well, so so when we go years back, and you both referenced this, right? There was a, a, a funding mechanism, and the one of the focus areas was AMI, right? So, and it, it was sort of the birth of of really AMI at scale. Um, do you see something similar happening? Like, what what do you see being prioritized this this time around? And and I I say that because again, we'll go back to the last iteration of GRIP, 58 projects, 44 states, you can imagine the different boxes that they checked, right? Uh, Rural, urban, uh, you know, IOU, Muni, co-op, obviously 44 states, uh, transmission distribution. Um, So what do do you, do you see, or do you think there's a prioritization this time around? Karen, I'll start. I, I don't see a prioritization on a specific uh, topic, but I, I, a technology like Cinco phasers and AMI were the two big technologies in 2009 for the Recovery Act. Uh, I, I don't see the emphasis on a specific technology. I, I do think that in um, the first round, wildfire prevention, detection and prevention was a, was a category and microgrids were a big focus. So, so and, and I think I think microgrids check a lot of boxes this time around as well because they meet a lot of the um, yeah. the intention in the in the big buckets of resilience as well as providing flexibility. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think and I and I will say that um, there is a big push on virtual power plants at D, within DOE. So if you if you go back and look at what uh, the the is in the language I think we had a really wonderful speaker um, at uh, um, at Grid Connects who had also done an analysis of the um, the grants from the first time around she actually did a word and then she looked at the at the uh, language in the second round the FOA and she did a word analysis and she's like you got to do that because you've got to grab what DOE is looking for and give it back to them in the applications and so I do think 
it, it that's really important. Even if you, you know, they're they're telling people if you applied the first time and you didn't get the funding, it doesn't mean you shouldn't take that project and apply for the second round of funding, but you for sure can't use the same application. You really have to take that first round application and make it fit the second round. And one way to do that and we tell people when they're looking for jobs at federal agencies too, is to make sure your resume includes all the buzzwords, do it for your application too. You gotta use all the buzzwords in the in the FOA. Uh, having, uh, I'm smiling because I, I have two daughters, 23 and 21, and, and the number of times we've said, um, you know, when you get a, a paper assignment from a professor, the professor has basically written a paper for you. All you all you have to do is to say back to them what they just said in the you know in the in the framework, right? So, um, and and I'm I'm assuming Calvin, that's part of the West Monroe advice is is you know read read the framework and then and then make sure you check you know it's very it's very straightforward. Yeah, you know we we have explicitly as part of our postmortem was exactly that exercise, similar exercise, Karen. Word, word check on what's new. We have an entire kind of guide on so how our grant writing teams will support and it is include these words, specific words and also just do these words align with the proposal that you know the utility is trying to get. Uh, and if you don't check those boxes, I think it's not a technology thing, it's, it's, it's is it in, innovative? Is it industry leading? Is it de-risking these innovative technologies? Are you tying those benefits? These are words in the new FOA I would encourage everyone to read read through the, the before and after and using exactly to what and, and I, think, I think that's really important because the reality is that the way utilities make investments, it, it's not like they see a FOA and say, well, wow, let's develop a project around the FOA. You, you, you're, they're making long-term investments and those come with long-term plans and they're trying to figure out how the funding can help accelerate and expand those long-term plans that's that's the way to think about it is you're taking things you were going to do making them broader making them very specific to a targeted uh, community or you know doing more than you would ordinarily do but it, it, that's the tension between the doe's desire that these are transformational yeah. versus that utilities plan longer term for these very large investments yeah, no, I, I I I love that. So we're coming we're coming up to the end of our of our 45 minutes. Um, something we always do on Industry Insights is um, we ask what industry insight you would like to leave the the audience with. Uh, so uh, sometimes people go completely off script and talk about you know their their favorite red wines, but most often it is confined constrained within the context of the uh, of the topic of the day so uh so i will start calvin with you what what industry insights you want to leave us with so um i think first and foremost recognizing that this is because one of those once in a lifetime or a few times in a lifetime opportunities to do something like this um i mean we alluded to the ara grants back in you know more than a decade plus again a year ago um and 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 this is basically manifesting itself again. Um, they don't happen on an annual basis. This is not something that, so, so, so now is the opportunity to really be intentional in thinking about it. And I, I will steal <laughs> kind of what Karen, your last comment is. The other insight is, you know, utilities, you know, you, you will tend to, a lot of to, oftentimes when we think of projects, they'll propose a lot of things that are in their long-term plan and perhaps they aren't necessarily innovative enough or industry leading. But, but I think it is an opportunity and I challenge folks that are looking at this round to leverage some of the stuff that you're looking at, you know, and have plans, but also broaden your scope of it, you know, challenge yourself. We're kind of, the, as we kind of say in smart brainstorming, so is, is it cool? Does it sound really cool? And if it does, then that's, you know, that's a good kind of first filter. Um, so anyway, that, that is kind of the, the two things. This is uh, once in a lifetime and um, 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 to just really start to think innovatively and challenge yourselves out of awesome. your kind of the process. Awesome, Karen. Yeah, I want to build on that uh, and that innovation piece because we're seeing a lot of our utility members um, look at technology and look at innovation very differently. They're thinking about, um, you know, whereas some of these some of our bigger utilities would have nothing to do with startups. They now have like you know innovation centers built yep. into 
uh, they're, they're, you know, they'll have a lab where they can do test beds and they have relationships with multiple startup companies. So I think explaining that to DOE as you do the application that, that actually utilities are um, embracing innovation and, and trying to bring it in in a way that that makes their regulators com comfortable that keep you know that that makes their their um, field people comfortable that makes their yeah. customers comfortable so I, I i think for my insight is that the this is an industry that has been slow traditionally to embrace industry innovation but technology is changing so rapidly that um that in order to to have the grid be a platform for the resilience, security, reliability that we know we need, affordability, and decarbonization. Yeah. Utilities are looking to embrace, uh, you know, innovation in a, in a wholly new and interesting way, and making sure that DOE, that funding from DOE helps to accelerate that embracement. I think is is yeah. uh, what what we're looking at. Is key. Sure. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, both of you for joining us. Um, I do want to note if you have been invited to the uh, Q&A session that's uh, that's happening after the panel, uh, please check your your uh, drop off this and join the Teams uh, link that you were given. But uh, Karen, I want to thank you. Calvin, I want to thank you. To obviously, uh, you know, thought leaders on this, and uh, very much at Anterix, we appreciate your time. So thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.